Lincoln Beach, he thought it was a dream to go up to heaven in a flying machine. The machine broke down and down he fell. He thought he'd go to heaven, but he went to Lincoln Beach, he thought it was a dream. Lincoln Beachy was born March 3, 1887 in San Francisco, and he died 28 years later. He was a pioneer, American aviator, inventor, and daredevil who worked with a series of other famous inventors and aviators of that time. He became famous and wealthy from flying exhibitions, his iconic aerial stunts, and setting aviation records. So, why am I bringing this up? Well, recently, just found it in the family tree, my family has learned that this is one of our relatives. And it's not really that surprising, as in... I've got a whole bunch of relatives with that same last name, Beachy. We do know that the Beachy family ended up in the Amish community from very early on in American history and stayed there for quite a while. Now, my portion of the Amish community, my grandparents and such, they did leave, but that's only my grandparents. Before that, Lincoln Beachy's parents had left the Amish community before he was born and that's how he ended up in San Francisco because there are no Amish in San Francisco. So what was happening there, the untold story to add to any article on Lincoln Beachy and what happened, well his grandparents decided to leave the Amish community due to religious differences but then not too long after leaving the Civil War was coming and they didn't want to fight in that in general. They would also have been in the North during that time, and they particularly did not want to join up with a Northern army. They didn't want to be drafted into that. So they made their way out West, and that's exactly what put Lincoln Beachy in San Francisco when he was born. So from these shared Amish origins, what of my relative? Well, Lincoln Beachy was known as the man who owns the sky sometimes the master birdman, and the world's greatest aviator. Working with various inventors, he was flying professionally by the age of 17, and also collaborating in design. He helped design a faster, more aerodynamic dirigible known as the Beachy Baldwin, and also the Beachy Nabins Hugh racing airship balloon, which he flew at the 1910 Los Angeles International Air Meet at Dominguez Field. At this same time, he was also flying fixed-wing aircraft, which he would become famous using as one of the greatest aviators in the world, doing a variety of death-defying stunts that others were completely incapable of doing. In the 1911 Los Angeles Air Show, Beachy made the first successful recovery from a nose-diving spin from an altitude of over 3,000 feet. No previous pilot had survived a similar situation. In June of that year, the U.S. Canadian Carnival offered a $1,000 cash prize to the first person who could fly an airplane over Niagara Falls. Beachy not only flew over the lower Niagara Falls, but then over the American Falls, circled several times, and then he dove down into the mist of the falls within six meters of the surface of the Niagara River. He then flew his plane under the Honeymoon Bridge, six meters above the rapids and down the length of the Niagara Gorge. You can probably start to see how he got so famous. His achievements include inventing figure eights and the vertical drop. He was also the first pilot to achieve terminal velocity by flying straight toward the ground. Several pilots died trying to imitate him. I should also tell you that his speciality in diving with the plane was not just making the plane dive. He did this with his hands outstretched presumably with his head back watching the world tumble to him and a rush of excitement that he couldn't match anywhere else. And as he pulled up next to the stunned audience, he was gripping the controls with his legs, still hands-free. Apparently, my relative was not too keen on the women driver question, though. He once dressed up as a woman and made his plane seem completely out of control to joke about Blanche Stewart Scott of Woman Flyer. In one year, 17 million people had seen him fly. At the time, the population of the United States was just 90 million people. So think about that. That's nearly one in five of every man, woman, and child in America at that time. 
Perhaps if you go around the classroom today, you can get that kind of recognition for a viral music video, maybe a TV show, but all stuff on screen, right there in your home. When was the last time that this percentage of people trekked out to see a particular stunt or a musical act? These people, a huge portion of America, went out to see my distant relative cheat death and invent aerial maneuvers before their eyes with an unmatched courage. They cheered and screamed, maybe fainted, and for those that didn't see him that year, I'm sure so many wanted to see him next year. A lot of them got the chance. They wanted to see the amazing accomplishments of Western man and a single man who could both design these machines and then fly them like a bird, exhibiting the too long forgotten daredevil attitude of Western man. Orville Wright said, an aeroplane in the hands of Lincoln Beachy is poetry. His mastery is a thing of beauty to watch. He is the most wonderful flyer of all. However, in 1913, the deaths of pilots attempting the same tricks as him upset Beachy. He counted 24 young pilots who he knew who had died, and he spent a period of time going in and out of retirement. When he came out of retirement, it was again to master tricks. He toured the country with Barney Oldfield, a race car driver, and they would race plane versus car, Beachy letting Oldfield win at times to keep the crowd excited. With this money, he built the Little Looper and worked on perfecting the loop trick. After finishing his first fully successful loop, he wrote, The Silent Reaper of Souls and I shook hands that day. Thousands of times, we've engaged in a race among the clouds plunging headlong into breathless flight, diving and circling with awful speed through ethereal space. And many times, when the dazzling sunlight has blinded my eyes and sudden darkness has numbed all my senses, I've imagined him close at my heels. On such occasions, I have defied him, but in so doing have experienced fright which I cannot explain. Today, the old fellow and I are pals. In 1914, he dive-bombed the White House and Congress in a mock attack, <laughs> and I say mock in that it was taken well, but at that time they really didn't have very many capabilities to take down such flying machines. His death would come in 1915 at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. He was flying one of his designs, the Beachy Eaton monoplane and in front of the crowd took off, turned, and flew the plane upside down while attempting to level it. He initially had it under control in this trick, but he was flying too low over the bay, and when he realized this, he tried to flip the plane back, but the strain caused the spars in the wings to break, and they crumpled, plunging him into the water below. The autopsy showed that he had somehow survived a crash from so high with just a broken leg, but he had been unable to get out of his harness and had drowned. Even after it took Navy men an hour and 45 minutes to retrieve him, they took three hours to try to revive him. They had all watched his stunts, and he was a national hero to them. So there you have it though. There's your story of our ancestrally related Amish flying man who... <laughs> could build these planes and then do death-defying stunts that so few people could imitate, if any. And the point of this especially is that all this time there's his like Wikipedia page and some good references throughout pop culture to this man and to his name, but I didn't realize until just now that he is a direct relation. And I think this, though, at the same time emphasizes how small of a family we really are as Western kind. How, when we really look into things, we'll find accomplishments. Your family tree, it, there's so much, I would think, that you have going on there. Going back through the accomplishments of our past, people who built up cities, knights, and aviators, inventors, 
who knows who knows you have so much going on and i would think a lot of you would be in the same position that you could just find someone who is fairly well known pretty easily and that's an aspect too of the amount of accomplishment and history and at the same time i'm not just excited because this would be the most famous of my relatives right now but what it does do for me certainly is it shifts my thinking in how I think about the building up and successes of Western technology, innovation, invention, and just that drive to defy death in insane ways. Because I got thinking to myself that in a lot of ways, I think too often, even we, think of ourselves as individuals, just individuals, that so often we're distracted by just our own talents. Distracted by what we're good at. Distracted by what we have ourselves achieved. Maybe not too much in terms of money or fame or success on our own. However, that's a way of thinking about yourself that is more individualistic. And let's say Jordan Peterson-esque. And that's a problem. This really expresses why that's a problem. Because when you're thinking about yourself just in terms of your own accomplishments, how much your own life has been put together, and no doubt that's important. It's important to have some sense of control and bettering yourself. But what we can really do is better expressed as what we accomplish together. Lincoln Beachy had a team of other people that he was working with other barnstormers that were inspiring him, working with him, other inventors that he initially flew their airplanes and then he learned how to change and modify the inventions himself. And he was following in his brother's footsteps too, Hillary Beachy. And then in modern day, what do I see? I see some of my family on very interesting paths. I know about some of my close relatives who build house after house. That's certainly worth something. They don't have their Wikipedia pages, but they have certainly contributed a lot to America in the past. And I know about the future, what we can do. I'm hard at work at a world famous sort of architecture firm, but that's just one thing. I know I can't go out and just build houses by myself. And I certainly know I can't go out and fly an airplane myself, or do stunts like that myself, or certainly I can't invent the airplanes myself. But then I have other relatives that, you know, they're becoming scientists, stuff like this. And if you really chart out your family tree, I'm sure a lot of you will find how many people in your ancestry have brave the frontiers, have been explorers, have led expeditions, have done exciting things, have built up the country, built buildings, composed musical masterpieces, who knows? You'll find them though. And what happens when you kind of trace this reference of your family's overall talents, you just sort of expand and expand and think about your family, think about all that recorded history, all that amazing recorded history, you'll find that you don't just have to do it alone. You don't just have to have only your own talents and say, well, I can do this. You can say, instead, we as a group form the collective that is needed to innovate and to perpetuate Western kind and Western civilization. So I would encourage you to try it look into your family history and expand it little by little by little and realize that the entirety of western creation and innovation it's not just inside you but it's inside you when you are working collectively with other western peoples with our people i certainly find these thoughts inspiring and i do believe that if we can preserve even a remnant of our best people, then we do indeed have a future. And 
just like as Rome fell, Venice rose up out of the mud. I do think even a remnant can continue, enhance, and even advance our future.